Welcome back to the Health Longevity Secret Show, and I'm your host, Dr. Robert Lufkin. Pharmacological approaches to longevity using drugs like rapamycin and acarbose via targeting signaling molecules like mTOR and insulin continue to see growing support. Today, we speak with Bradley S. Rosen, MD, whose practice focuses on living healthier and longer through biogerontology. Dr. Rosen graduated with a degree in mathematics and statistics and an MD from the University of Florida. His residency was his Jules Stein Eye Institute at UCLA, followed by two retina fellowships at the Lions Eye Institute and the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. In 2013, Dr. Rosen joined a growing number of scientists and clinicians who are becoming increasingly interested in the fact that the hallmarks of aging themselves can and should be targeted for therapy. And now please enjoy this conversation with Bradley S. Rosen, MD. Hi, Brad, welcome to the show. Thank you, Rob. I'm very happy to be here and I really appreciate the opportunity. I've listened to a number of your guests and your shows and I've learned a lot and uh, it's a privilege and um, I'm thankful to be here. Well, I'm, I'm, it's so great to have you on the, on the program and I, I'm so excited. I can't wait to dive into some things with longevity and the amazing work you're doing in that area. But before we do that, maybe we could take a moment and uh, just tell us a little bit about how you came to be so interested in this fascinating area. Oh, sure. Um, so my background is uh, essentially a little bit different. I, I think that one of the great things about this uh, longevity as an, as an area of interest is the wide range of uh, people that are involved. Um, and my background in, is as a physician, I trained as a surgeon. I worked uh, as a, a essentially a retinal specialist, which made me a essentially a vascular surgeon of the eye. And I dealt with managing patients who had uh, complications of diabetes, complications of high blood pressure, uh, essentially vasculopathies of all sorts, including uh, uh, inflammatory disorders, uh, lip disorders. And over the years, I got to see with my own eyes uh, how these things looked inside the retina, how the blood vessels changed, how the tissue surrounding the blood vessels in the, in the retina and the subretinal areas uh, changed, and also how the patients themselves did. Um, many times, these were people who looked uh, perfectly healthy on the outside and looking inside the eyes kind of gave an insight that maybe things weren't as healthy inside as they were outside and looking at the various metrics and predicting outcomes just became something that I had a strong affinity to. And um, I left retinal surgery in 2015 and through a combination of personal interest and interest that certain of my friends had, slowly became interested in this space. It probably started when a very intelligent friend of mine, uh, who I respect, uh, asked me uh, if I could prescribe him rapamycin. And uh, I had no idea what this was. I thought that he may have lost his mind. And um, I started to, you know, look into the space from there. And I slowly realized that there's a body of very serious scientific work um, looking at this problem. And I realized that once a person who's thinking allows this idea that your healthy lifespan or your health span or the amount of years that you have you're robust and healthy can be extended um it's a very hard idea to let go of it's it's a compelling idea it's like what could i possibly do with my time with my resources 
that would be a, a better way to spend that than to give me more time and my friends more time and my family more time to be healthy and able to in, in, enjoy life. And I think some of the research is compelling that ageism, aging is a malleable process. Uh, we don't have the answers yet, but I think that to view it as an unsolvable problem is not rational at this point. Yeah, and as, as a retinal surgeon, I, like as you say, I, I can see how you were facing daily uh, some of the chronic diseases that are most strongly associated with aging, things like you know, diabetes and vascular disease and hypertension and all right there, right there in your space. Um, so what, what is your overall philosophy about longevity or aging? How does that, how does that work in your mind? So, so, yeah, so uh, I think that's a great question. Um, I think that the answer, it's probably a little bit dependent on which hat I'm wearing as a, as an individual, um, you know, I think conceptualizing and theorizing and, 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 uh, reading the, all the, the studies that are out there and all the lines of thought that are out there is, you know, it's a pastime. It's enjoyable. Um, it's fascinating. Uh, it's inspiring. Um, it leads you to be in touch with, um, you know, very in impressive thinkers, uh, some of whom you've interviewed, uh, many of whom or most of whom, whom you know. Um, but as a professional, um, as, a, as a physician who's taking care of patients, um, really, I think the framework that I'm, I'm relying on is this time dependent um, increase in probability of suffering some disabling condition or some fatal event. And as you age, the likelihood of that, you know, rises. Uh, unfortunately, as we get a little bit further down the path, the, the rate that that probability of, of uh, you know, failure to be resilient uh, becomes exponential. And so I feel like the medical approach I'm trying to um, stay as close as I can to is min minimizing the risk of experiencing one of those age-related events and exploring some of the therapeutic agents that can help delay the rate at which uh, you know, one is susceptible, one loses their resilience. And so I try to combine, um, you know, a, a somewhat uh, precautionary approach, like I'm trying to not uh, expose people to any additional risk, while, while also trying to um, make available some of these newer therapies that seem to target aging, um, which generally have a long track record of use in healthcare, which regulatory agencies have looked at and have given us a fairly good handle on risk for, um, and which, you know, as we know, we all these diseases that are age dependent are wonderful to uh, try and stop, but addressing the root, uh, uh, the root uh, drive in the process where you become more likely to have all these problems is going to have way bigger dividends than addressing any of the individual diseases. So to the extent that that's true, um, I think I am very willing to look at a select number of agents that, you know, the preponderance of evidence supports no proof. We're never going to get it in this space. Um, and, but at the same time, there, we have enough game film uh, historically that we're not, you know, putting people at a risk that we can't quantify in terms of long tail. Like you take something that's brand new for 10 years, um, 
that's a different story than taking something that has a 20 year uh, clinical history. So um, that's my approach. And, you know, obviously I'm fascinated with the mTOR system and the idea of programmatic aging. I am fascinated by all the newer uh, metabolic studies looking at the glucose pathways um, and how they impact the rate at which we age, the rate at which we experience events. And of course, the newer modalities are what my friends and uh, a lot of patients will ask about. I, I know recently you had a very impressive guest on talking about barbaric uh, oxygen and its role in aging. And these are fascinating topics uh, that I'm, I'm very curious about, but have yet to incorporate. Mm -hmm. And so um, just backing up a little bit, yeah, as you say, aging in itself is the is a, a primary risk factor for essentially all of the all of the chronic or the majority of the chronic diseases that we face. So by being able to attack aging at a basic level, then we can theoretically improve our our chances of, of not getting these diseases or pushing it back later um, as well for those. One question you just touched on is that something that uh, frequently comes up on a very basic level in longevity. I know back when I went to medical school, we were taught that, uh, that aging is just the uh, accumulation of uh, wear and tear on our bodies. Kind of like, hey, my car wears out, my, my house wears out, everything wears out, why shouldn't my body wear out? Um, is that your view of aging or you mentioned programming also? Yeah, so I mean, that's a, another great question. And I think that's an example of a, a framework that's compelling at first glance. But the reality is when we look around us and we see uh, that we're not alone as a species on this planet and we start to inventory what goes on in some of the other life forms, that share the world with us, the rate at which we, we age and the rate at which other organisms age, uh, certainly very different. But the rate at which environmental factors accumulate in each of these agents, at least the exposure, uh, should be comparable. So it's hard for me to say that I'm taking fewer environmental insults on a day-to-day -day basis than uh, say my dog is. Um, I think that we're being exposed to comparable amounts of radiation, comparable amounts of uh, you know, uh, food intake and processing, uh, pathogens, uh, wear and tear physically on our bodies. Uh, and uh, you know, maybe not precisely the same in the wear and tear physically between my dog and I, but you know, they're not so uh, disparate that it would explain that my pup is going to be old at 13 and uh, I was just hitting my prime then. So there's certainly going to be more to the story. There has to be more to the story than wear and tear. And, you know, I think that is a great example of how it is that sometimes the common sense answers, um, especially when it's a uh, around a topic like aging, which I feel psychologically most people have relegated to this place of, you know, this belongs in the category of things that's inevitable, that we can't change, I'm willing to believe it. And that is a um, state of mind that limits curiosity. It allows for answers to come up that aren't, you know, that we don't wanna necessarily or don't tend to challenge. So um, do I think wear and tear is important? Yes, but I think that um, to answer the problem and help ourselves and our patients, uh, we definitely wanna look beyond that. Yeah, before you mentioned, you just touched on mTOR as well as um, glucose uh, signaling and glucose utilization pathways. Um, how do those, um, what's your thinking on how those uh, play a role in longevity? 
So if, if it's okay, um, before I do that, I'd like to just step back and, and reframe the way that I conceive of the approach to patients. And then within that context, I'd love to talk about both mTOR inhibition and uh, you know, metabolism as it pertains to insulin sensitivity and, and the like, if that's okay. Great, I would love it, yeah. Okay, perfect. So um, for most patients in 2022, based on what we have available to us as tools that are uh, proven or highly likely to be beneficial to us, um, what I'm trying to do is to recognize that there's a group of patients, uh, probably there are people a little bit like us, who have reached a point in their life where they recognize that biologically, there's a downhill trajectory ahead of us. And um, the question we can ask is, can we impact that in some way that benefits us? And so I think you can almost look at it simply and say like a 50 year old person or a 45 year old person wants to make it to 90 and they'd like to make it to 90 robust and able to enjoy life. So if that's the problem you're solving for, what are the ways that you can uh, achieve that goal? And so now you're in, you know, you're in a situation where you have a problem and you can optimize for it. So you have uh, all these risks that are gonna be in, in this field, say from age 50 to 90 or 45 to 90, there's gonna be risks that are there and they're gonna be popping up. It seems obvious that the more of those risks we can take off the table, the higher the likelihood that we're gonna be able to get to that other side of the field intact. In so how can we do that? Uh, looking at the data on diet, looking at the data on exercise, looking at the data on sleep uh, can help us optimize our behavior so that we're uh, giving ourselves high probability of success, looking at the medical diseases and conditions that are most likely to impact us uh, in that time period. And we're fortunate because there's data there that tells us cardiovascular disease, um, cancer, neurodegenerative disease, falls uh, are pretty much, when you sum up the variations on those, um, the most high likelihood uh, risk factors to mitigate. And fortunately, a lot of those have uh, uh, modifiable risk. And then the last is, do you take into account the possibility that some of these putative aging uh, medications or anti-aging medications have merit and can confer some of the same benefits they're conferring on uh, animal models on us. And how compelling is the data? What are the risks of each one of, the, one of these? And can I use my inference knowing that I have to basically shy away from having randomized controlled studies to rely on, which in medicine we love, um, to be a little bit more forward-looking and offer a patient who, who truly looks at this question, how do I get to 90 intact without having taken too many extra major hits? Um, are there, can, I, can I adopt some of these other newer medicines? And I think that the strategy really would call for, assuming that you're dealing with the right patient um, and the right, the patient, that patient's risk tolerance, um, yes, you know, that, uh, it's obvious that if a anti-aging medication eventually works, it's going to be available well before it's validated as for sure true. And so philosophically or strategically, if you're a person who exists in a time where that medicine has not been validated, but you want to take advantage of it, definitionally, you have to be willing to um, take a calculated risk in that, in that space. And so 
that is pretty much the, the A to Z of what I'm offering patients. Um, I think the biggest benefits are really a balance of all three. I think if you're not looking at how you eat and exercise and your sleep is a mess, uh, it's, you're not really gonna get much further. And I think if you're not mitigating your cardiovascular risk uh, or you are you know, metabolically unhealthy, there's evidence that you are you know, more likely to be struck down early. And then these amazing anti-aging uh, drugs that are so you know, sexy and um, appealing, uh, I think that you can look at the data and have an intelligent conversation with intelligent patients and come to the conclusion that on balance, because of who I am, not, not me personally, but who any of the patients I'm seeing are, that's the way I want to live is by, you know, following the strategy and being maybe a little bit out in front of my skis to position myself to be uh, able to take advantage of the, these things when they, when they, uh, when they work. So um, that's that. Uh, if yeah, that, you have, that's, go ahead, sorry. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I can answer any questions about that, uh, or I can add, I can start going into the, uh, the 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 answers about the mTOR and the glucose. I I do feel strongly about uh, generally both the you know approach that medicine in general and patients in particular take about their cardiovascular risk. I I look at that as as just this extra risk that most people have floating around that they're unaware of fully at least, um, and are, I, I think the major, most patients are more, most people are mo more willing to look ahead at the anti-aging, the patients that see me, um, but I think most of them are very, also very uh, comfortable and satisfied um, hearing about how data and dietary exercise and cardiovascular risk management in particular uh, mesh because uh, it's 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 the case that there's just so much uh, disparate and uh, disagreeing information available to most patients if you uh, think about them as consumers uh, when they go on the internet yeah, I mean, the point you're making is excellent. No matter how good these longevity drugs are, it's, it's not a free ticket to live any lifestyle you want, get poor sleep, uh, diet out of control, and, and those, those other screening for those diseases is really key and cardiovascular risk. So getting all those things are, are key in place. Just a quick side note on the cardiovascular risk, is a CT calcium score your go-to test or is it more labs for that to assess the risk? So I would say that the totality of the data is the best always and more information is more personalized, better stratification of risk is better. I think though uh, that if I had a patient who's lab, who had a pretty profound dyslipidemia, um, you know, who had, uh, you know, I don't know what was the preferred word. People can use uh, APOB. They could use non-HDL. If they really want to get in trouble, they could use LDLC. Um, but when these levels are high, risk is high. And I would say that, especially in a person who is coming to me and saying, you know, how can I mitigate my risk? Um, I would say that if you're running around with an APOB, level that is, you know, above the 25th percentile, and you're living in a nation where anywhere from 25 to 33 percent of us are going to be essentially taken off the board um, due to a cardiovascular event of some sort, then you're running around with risk that you don't need to. And if you're coming to somebody who's offering you a longevity strategy, uh, who's not mentioning that to you, uh, they're not doing as much, you're not getting as much as you could from the visit. Uh, that's just my take. And I know that um, 
you know, I might as well be making a political statement <laughs> with a comment on cholesterol. But um, I feel I feel like the data is overwhelming. So um, that's that. So, that's where. I so, yeah. So that's a point well taken on that, I think. So let's say, assuming we, we have our diet under control, our exercise control, our sleep, we've done our risk factors, we've done our cardiovascular risk. Now we, we want to optimize longevity. What, what are the, the go-to drugs that you think are the most exciting or most promising that you use in, in your practice today? Okay. Uh, so I think that, the, that I'm not alone in recognizing that the data supporting rapamycin is the strongest data uh, of all the uh, agents that uh, are commonly considered. Um, you have, um, first of all, uh, a plethora of longevity related data in animals. You have lifespan ex extension in rodents, yeast, worms, uh, some higher, uh, not a lot of, I'm going to use the higher mammals, but other ma mammals, um, robust longevity uh, and health span en enhancement, multiple labs, multiple investigators, multiple doses. Um, that's exciting, um, especially when you consider the aspect of rapamycin that I think gets a good amount of attention, but you know, for us, I think is particularly exciting, which is you can induce or introduce uh, rapamycin later in life and get great benefit from that. Um, so, you know, a, 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 a strategy like lifetime caloric restriction, where some of the data says, well, if you do it later in life, you've missed the boat on that, uh, isn't as exciting. As, uh, as rapamycin is in that regard. So you have the longevity data, you have a ton of uh, individual uh, metrics, which you always need to interpret with caution. Uh, you know, if, 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 if X causes Y uh, in the lab, then the idea that you could put it into an organism and assume that Y will happen reliably, and because Y is related to Z, you can expect Z as an outcome, uh, doesn't fully take into account that we are complex systems. And we, the definition of a complex system is that you put in an input and you get a nonlinear out, out, output. So that said, you still wanna see favorable uh, results. You still wanna see uh, favorable results in many domains, which with rapamycin you do. You see vascular, uh, you see improvements in, in uh, endothelial health and the responsiveness to nitrous oxide. Uh, you see uh, immune improvement. You see memory improvement in older animals, learning improvement in older animals. You see improvement in cognitive function in Alzheimer's models with a rapamycin dose, dosing. Um, you see greater density of uh, capillary beds and neural tissue. All of these things, I think, uh, if they were to be found in people, if you did these things, would not be sufficient to tell you that, that you're going to get a longevity benefit, but they're, they're the kinds of things that you would like to see. And then the limited data that we have in people, you know, seems to show enhanced adaptive immune response, increased uh, thickness in gum tissue, uh, reduced tendency to sarcopenia, improvement in osteoarthritic metrics. So these are somewhat these are not somewhat, these are exciting findings. And you're talking about a, a drug that certainly is not trivial, but there's a good amount of uh, data on rapamycin use. And at low doses, it's generally well tolerated. People will get aptus ulcers, which they don't find to be uh, overly bothersome. A subset will have uh, a drop in their neutrophil count, which sometimes can be concerning, especially if they 
already have a low uh, blood count and you look at them after a few months of rapamycin and now they're technically, you know, have a little or a lot of pancytopenia, that is uh, something that makes me uneasy. But most patients don't have pancytopenia and most patients, if you put them on rapamycin, you'll see a, a, a somewhat of a reduction in their white blood cell count. But when you think about what rapamycin is used for and what it does in the context of immunosuppression or immunomodulation, that's not a big surprise. Um, and I found that most patients tolerate the rapamycin very well. Um, some, again, this is anecdotal, so you know, not putting a lot of credence in it, but um, a sense of well-being, a reduced uh, sense that the aches and pains that are associated with getting older are as bothersome, uh, a little bit better, you know, exercise or activity tolerance uh, as a result of this, uh, you know, not being so sore. Um, so I would say that rapamycin is the probably top uh, choice that I would have for a person who's looking for uh, an agent in, 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 to complement their health in anti-aging. Um, and then there's three others that I, I, I consider as well. Uh, Acarbose is usually the, the first one I bring up with patients because it is uh, generally safe. It's also, uh, I, you know, the ITP, you're very familiar with the ITP. I would presume the listeners are mostly familiar with the ITP, but let's just call it the gold standard for animal models of longevity. Um, and so ACARBOS had positive results in the ITP, which to me makes it a, a, a better candidate than a, a, a substance that doesn't. Um, and you can reduce postprandial glucose peaks. You tend to improve uh, glycated uh, hemoglobin or hemoglobin A1C. Um, and in patients do, that have dom documented impaired glucose tolerance or frank diabetes, there's really good outcome data that shows uh, reduction in events. And so you cannot completely extrapolate, but um, one way to think about diabetics is that they have abnormal sugar metabolism, but another is to look at them as a group of patients that have high event rates. So if you're looking for agents that reduce events, uh, that patient population is a good group to see them because you're gonna, you're, you're gonna need a lot fewer patients to power the study to see uh, an effect because the event rate is so high compared to normals. Um, and so, yeah, the truth is that we don't know if in people who have no insulin resistance at all, uh, acarbose is gonna help, but there's a, a fair amount of circumstantial evidence that minimizing peak glucose levels and um, reducing the amount of glu uh, simple carbohydrates that you effectively consume is gonna help. Um, so that's an agent that I, I endorse. And just uh, one point on a carbos, excuse me. Uh, it is sure. FDA approved for, for diabetes use is the indication and it blocks, uh, carbohydrate absorption from the gut. And, and, and as you say, it, it flattens those glucose spikes. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. No, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Sometimes I forget where I'm at. So I appreciate any <laughs> clarification always. Um, and then, um, you know, it's uh, another anti-diabetic or uh, medicine that's used in diabetic patients is metformin, which gets a lot of press. Um, I uh, will prescribe metformin after having a careful conversation with patients so that they understand, you know, why they're taking it, what the potential downsides are, what the potential promise is. Um, I think that the observational data that drew interest for metformin, that basically, if you listen to uh, near bars live talk, you will have uh, an abundance of uh, enthusiasm and excitement. And I think rightfully so, based on 
the enormity of the number of patients that have been involved in the observational studies where you're looking at preferential survival, you're looking at lower cancer rates and a variety of cancer subtypes that are common. Um, you're looking at better COVID survival on patients that are taking metformin compared to diabetic patients that aren't taking metformin. Um, and then there's also these various uh, animal studies that seem to confirm the pleiotropic benefits of metformin in areas that are not that uncommon, not that unrelated to uh, rapamycin, where you have, you know, in markers for vascular health improvement, markers for immune health and improvement, and you clearly reduce the risk in normal patients or patients with moderately impaired glucose tolerance of becoming frankly diabetic. And I think that is another benefit. Um, metformin did not have a good, uh, or did not show longevity benefits in the IATP, but um, rapamycin plus metformin seems to be a better longevity combination than rapamycin alone. So there's enough there to keep metformin in the conversation. I'm very excited to see the results of the TAME study. Most of the patients that I see, I counsel that if we go on the metformin route or we go on the rapamycin route or we go on the route of any of these uh, anti-aging medicines, if and when data becomes available, that puts the question mark over the utility. And most importantly, makes one wonder like, are we harming ourselves by doing this? I'll be very quick to pivot because going back to the strategy, making it to 90 unscathed involves taking medicines that will give you benefit and avoiding those that will give you uh, potential problems. So you have to be alert to this possibility, but also I think willing to take a bit of a chance. Um, so then there's a, two others. Uh, one is SGL, SGLT2 inhibitors as a class. Uh, um, so good ITP data uh, on uh, canagliflozin, I think, is the way it's pronounced. Um, Canna is the way I refer to it because it's so much easier. Um, and, um, you know, these drugs basically affect the sodium glucose transport, and you can kind of think of, the, of them as offloading excess uh, glucose in the blood when those levels start to peak, um, and as well as in the intestine, kind of uh, keeping more glucose in the intestine than, in, than, 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 than transporting into the body. Um, the reason that I'm really uh, enthusiastic about the SGL T2 inhibitors is because the human outcome data is just so strong. The reductions in cardiovascular events, the improvements in blood pressure, the improvements in hemoglobin A1C, the benefits with respect to weight, um, they all argue for a positive effect here. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's for state of the art care, it's now mandatory to treat type two diabetics with SGLT2 inhibitors if you're trying to give them best care. Increasingly uh, forward thinking doctors who are looking at patients who are at risk for heart failure or kidney failure are utilizing um, SGLT2 inhibitors and finding benefits independent of the patient's ability to uh, manage, manage their glucose metabolically. So non-diabetics, non, -diabetics, non insulin uh, resistant patients getting benefits there and the ITP being positive. So the problem with the, the, uh, the class of drugs is it's a relatively expensive medicine still. And, um, uh, um, you know, it's not obvious that it'll, most patients will get uh, their insurance to cover it. So it's, a, it's an expense question, but I think that it's an exciting drug to follow. Um, and the last, uh, I think we talked about, excuse me, in our earlier conversation was the synolytic uh, approach, which 
I think is going to have potentially a very promising future. I really would love not only for uh, Spricel or Dasatinib in particular, but for all of these medicines from rapamycin to acarbose to metformin to the SGLT2 one inhibitors to Dasatinib to have more data, but particularly with Dasatinib, uh, I wish there were more human data on its use as a synolytic to hang my hat on, but in theory, targeting senescent cells uh, is a very appealing avenue. Um, and again, in animals, um, both in the laboratory data and in a lot of the photographs that you can see when you see pa uh, patients, animals that have um, been given synolytic treatments from birth till adulthood, the differences in twin animals uh, side by side is striking. Um, so with the satinib, you know, I, I, I will certainly uh, prescribe it to a well-informed patient who is highly motivated. A lot of people don't tolerate it as well as they tolerate all the others. Uh, they can have flu-like feelings. They can be a little bit exhausted. They can spend a couple of days not feeling so great. Um, and when I would employ it, it would be very episodic. So I think, you know, four times a year is, is, is probably enough until, or unless we have more data, um, you know, spry cell is a, still a chemotherapeutic agent. It's a tyrosine kinase family drug. It's going to have a lot of effects. Um, so it's not, it's, it's not something that I will you know, suggest to every patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So your practice that, that you offer um, is, is based in Los, here in Los Angeles. Uh, and to be clear, it's a, it's a medical practice. It's not uh, coaching or anything like that. It's an actual medic medical practice where, as you say, you prescribe these, um, these longevity drugs, as well as uh, other recommendations for the patient to take care of their whole, their whole self. Uh, I guess a question, do you accept patients uh, from outside of Los Angeles? Uh, is there a telemedicine component to your practice that so, people can I take do. advantage of? Yeah, thank you very much. I do take telemedicine uh, patients. Ideally, uh, we'll have an in-person relationship, uh, especially with uh, both COVID and with the airline uh, situation being what it is right now, that can be challenging. Um, but uh, I'm open to uh, pretty much any patient who feels like the philosophy that we've shared and I've expounded on is appealing um, and is looking for guidance um, in an overall context of you know, making it to older age in as good a shape as they possibly can. Um, and maybe in the future, we'll be talking about an indefinite um, extension of life. But for now, um, if somebody can get, you know, 10 or 15 extra years, I think that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So much is going on in, in this area that it, it seems like every every few weeks there's there's another at least promising uh, research study and all it's so fascinating and the the itp you mentioned the interventions testing program is uh is a fascinating way to look at it's some of the some of the various drugs and supplements that people talk about being applied to this uh, this mouse animal model in a controlled fashion which is very exciting as well well, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you, Brad, and, and uh, find out more about your practice or, or uh, join your practice? We're going to be including it in the show notes down below. But for anybody who's listening to this podcast, uh, just in audio only form, maybe you could just tell them uh, the best way to reach you and follow you on social media. Oh, sure. Absolutely. So, the uh, website I have is mtormd, M-T-O-R-M-D.com. 
so that would be an introduction to me and the practice and what it is that I'm trying to accomplish. And a person can see if, if that is sort of uh, resonating with them. Um, and then I have a Twitter account that is mostly uh, focused on, on, this, on these topics. Um, and that's uh, Dr. Bradley Rosen or you know, Dr. Bradley Rosen, MD. Um, and uh, I think those are the best ways to find me. You can also send an email to me at mtormedicine at gmail.com. Great. Well, I, I think we, we, we've just scratched the surface on what we, what we cover. I think we, we need to do another session here and I'd love to, love to talk with you more and to kind of dive down into these great areas. But I, I just want to thank you today, Brad, for spending an hour with us and, and sharing your experience and the, the, the wonderful work you're doing on longevity and making, making these, these powerful, uh, potentially life-saving drugs available to patients in, you know, in the right, uh, in the right uh, setting, of course. But thanks so much for your work and thanks for being on the show. No, Rob, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And thank you also for bringing, you know, doing what you're doing with the, with their podcast and making all this information and uh, this whole area of thinking available to so many more uh, people. And to the extent that you would like to have me again, I would love to uh, be back. I think the, a lot of the things that I thought about before I came on uh, never came up. Um, so uh, absolutely, and uh, thank you. No, this is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking of it because of something you have seen here. If you find this to be of value of you, please hit that like button and subscribe to support the work we do on this channel. Also, we take your suggestions and advice very seriously. Please let us know what you'd like to see on this channel. Thanks for watching and we hope to see you next time.